not good. Yeah. And works. early years are so important, like absolutely the most important time for your development and, you know, set you up for all the different ways you're going to be fucked up <laughs> as <laughs> yeah. an adult. Oh, we're we're uh, all going to be fucked up eventually. Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah. How not, fucked up are we going to be? I'm not going to fuck up my kid in the ways that my parents <laughs> fucked me up. I'll find new ways, you know, <laughs> new exquisite, creative ways. Yeah. So. What, you, got, you got a son. Yeah. What does he make of you being a stand-up? Um, he, I think he thinks it's cool. Yeah, I was going to say, that would be such a cool thing. Yeah, I think for him it's been good because it m has meant that he's had lots of experiences of going to see shows that he maybe wouldn't have. Right. If he'd been like the kid of a normal yeah, yeah, person no. or parent <laughs> you know and when we worked with like terry alderton in the past we just sort of sneak the kids up, up in the back row and they would watch and we we deliberately snuck them in so that the other audience members didn't feel uncomfortable about the fact that there were kids there and we're like they're not like normal kids they're yeah yeah they're used they're, to this yeah yeah they're like what we call showbiz kids you know they're like <laughs> yeah. they've been exposed to all sorts of things that probably um weren't appropriate but yeah. you know they have a sort of different understanding of it and uh, yeah it yeah, would be a yeah. very cool job for your mum to have well yeah. we'll see yeah. does he <laughs> fast forward five years yeah, like, what age is he now? <laughs> he's 15 oh cool yes so uh, he will, do you think he'll start going out to the stand things soon enough yeah probably i imagine he will i mean we've we went to see during the fringe this year we went to see a lot of shows together yeah. um I managed to make a bit more time than I had the previous year because we make the TV show in the um, mm. during August, um, which takes up most of my time. But we did try and I did try and make some time um, to spend with him, but also go and see as many shows as I could. Sort of which some is, of our pals. Yeah, you know? that's it. It's always hard because you the, the start of the month you go right. I'm going to go and see everyone I love, and by the end you've seen ten. Yeah, and it wasn't the people that you intended to go and see, and you feel bad. Yeah, I feel bad if, for the people that I missed out, um, but I'm glad I did get to see quite a few of them. Uh, yeah, this any favourites? Hmm? Any favourites? Um, I really enjoyed Stuart McPherson's show. Oh, I thought Stu, it was yeah. excellent. Excellent show. Um, and Roscoe. Oh my God, um, yes. I absolutely love Roscoe and Amy Matthews. Then see Amy's. Um, and CMB. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh. Who else? Um, those are the ones that are occurring to me because they all happened in this street. Yes, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And that's how my brain works. It's like uh, association. Monkey barrel, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice actually to see um, new people as well. And I definitely got to see some other acts and other stuff through you know the things we were filming for the, for yeah. the tv show that must that seems like quite an intense thing to try and turn around in august yeah because we've got three episodes yeah uh, which doesn't sound like a lot but we can't start filming until the fringe starts because we're covering the fringe yeah or there's a limit to how much we can film before the fringe starts we did do a sort of showcase of local talent which we were able to do yeah um just actually down the road there yeah, yeah. uh um so you've sort of and then and you have to deliver the show sort of you know the day before it airs although sometimes mm -hmm. on the day it airs <laughs> um but that means it needs to be in post-production a couple of days before yeah. that and then so so actually the first show you only got a few days to to actually get out and get all the content filmed so it's quite hectic um and then you're just turning it around and there's no there's no late off. nights a lot of late nights and working every single day and but, you know, it's good and it's creative and we're really proud of, you know, the shows that we made and yeah. feel like we've gotten better every year. Yeah. And um, and it's just, it's nice to be able to get some of the acts that we know and love on the telly. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, so, yeah, it's, it's a crazy time of year, but I miss performing because there's no way I could do both. Yeah, I was going to say that you can you coming back. Yeah, so the the thought was maybe if we if we're lucky enough to be have a fourth series commissioned, whether maybe I could do like the last week of the fringe when we've delivered the last show, which is before yeah. the end, obviously. But that would require some kind of deep organizational skills that I do <laughs> not possess. <laughs> So I do not have mm, any of them either. So know thyself. I don't know whether that might be insane or. Yeah. But we'll see. Anyway, I'm doing Glasgow Comedy Festival show, yes. so we'll see how we get on with that. Yeah. Was and there then, a moment where you were like, fuck, I'm getting back into comedy? Was there a time when you were just like, I yeah. can't believe I've been out for so long? Yeah, I, I definitely felt that um, the pandemic 
it was the thing that sort of was the final nail in the coffin for me. I yeah. had been sort of feeling a bit, my confidence had taken a bit of a knocking um, even before the pandemic. And then just that, I, I did not like um, Zoom gigs because to me, the the reason I love comedy is the, the energy of a, a live performance yes. in front of people, feeling like you're connecting, feeling that sense of, you know, yeah. like shared experience. Um, and doing it online was awful. I hate yeah, Zoom. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I hate yeah. seeing myself. Um, and I did do Susie McCabe's gig actually. Uh, so the one with all the big screens. The green screen. Yeah, yeah that which was cool. really cool. And that was the sort of that was the best of all the yeah. that kind of because you had the audience on screens in front of you, and you were on a green screen. But it was there was still a bit of a delay before you heard. The reaction, so you had yeah. to just keep going, assuming that they were laughing. But it was a yeah, yeah, yeah. weird. Is it coming? Is it coming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, am I dying here? Um, but that, it, that was a great fun gig. But uh, yeah, just I just was like, this is not for me. And mm. then you leave it too long, and, you, and then you think, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And yeah, um, so I had a few gigs, and then just actually got too busy doing you know radio and TV stuff. Yeah, um, and I just felt like I sort of couldn't divide myself up. And because I'd sort of gotten a bit, you know, um, insecure yeah, about yeah. Uh, my myself as a performer, then I was leaning more into being a producer. Um, and now you're so, like, fuck it, I'm back. Fuck it, I'm back, yeah. Nice. I actually went to New York um, on holiday. Uh, we went to see Bruce Springsteen in New Jersey. Oh, nice. Which is cool. <laughs> uh, very cool. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was nice. Um, and that was the sort of impetus for the going... For, on that, the trip at the time and it was also the beginning of September at the end of the festival so it's something to look forward to when it was yeah. like ah tearing here out time um but I got a gig when I was over there not so that I could claim the flight back on my tax return <laughs> not at all no no not no at all um uh at a uh, a comedy club on Dugo Street so you know where the comedy cellar is yeah, yeah. so it's in the same sort of uh, same area uh, it's called the Grizzly Pear. Um, so I did that and I was quite nervous about it, but um, it was really fun. And I thought, oh my God, if you can do this. And there's also a thing of like, just being honest, time of life, you know, I'm, you know, perimenopausal. I know it's not going to be a fun word to hear. As no, no, like, go for it. Well. Um, it's, uh, it, it doesn't make you feel good describing yourself in that way, I have to say, as a woman, but it is what it is. Yeah. But you do get, you do start to give less of a fuck. Yes, this is uh, something I was going to say. <laughs> I've seen you some do some of your new material and you do not give a fuck. Yeah, I've sort of stopped caring so much. I mean, I do still care about what people think of me uh, deeply, but at the same time, I don't know, it doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to affect me as much and yeah. when I get on stage I feel like a lot freer and um and I don't know also my mum died earlier this year yeah. and and she was always very critical and I always felt like in a way maybe that I couldn't say things or yeah whatever and there is a, and then that sounds awful but um there there is an element of that of oh, being yeah, sort of yeah. a bit liberated to be like oh well fuck it I can say what I want now I can just be myself um, and I've definitely felt that and just starting from scratch again, starting totally new material Brilliant. going out. And actually, I realized from doing that, oh, this is this is the good bit. <laughs> yeah, this is what yeah. I enjoy about it. This yeah. is the thrilling part where you think, oh, I think I think this is funny. And then you go out and you say in front of people and they laugh and you go, it is funny. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, I could do this. I got it. You know, that is the best feeling. I think every comedian agrees on when a yeah. new bit works. Oh, it is just it's not, there's nothing that comes close it's to that. Great. That's the the addictive thing because I think I'd also got to the stage where because I'd been bad at writing new material because I didn't have Yes Bar anymore, which yeah. helped me. Which was a night that used to run new material and I used to run on a Wednesday, which I would compare every week. So and I am not good at writing. I have to do it sort of in right. the moment. Okay. And I would maybe have ideas, mad bullet points in my <laughs> notes on my phone. What does that mean? Love it. Um, that would be how I would write material. And because I had lost that, I'd sort of stopped writing as much. And I would sort of felt like I was just doing the same, the same thing over and over. And there's no fun in that. No. There's actually, you sort of hate yourself a bit for that. That's literally the, the sentence I thought in my head. I hate myself when I do yeah. a bit that for too long. Yeah. I've even got a bit of my set that I hate myself for. 
because I'm like, why am I still doing this? <laughs> yeah. But it's just like this two minute bit that's still, it works, but I hate myself. Yeah. And I've sort of gotten to that stage. And I think as well, I felt quite disconnected because it felt like a version of me that was sort of gone. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, I felt disconnected from those experiences, those stories that I was telling because they were from yeah. a different time. And I think we're constantly evolving. And um, I certainly feel like I've changed a lot in the last few years. I'm still me, but, you know, I feel like my ideas have shifted a little bit my attitudes changed um and so i want to be connecting with audiences as me in a more yes. authentic way no so, no yeah. day, Julia. so yeah. it has to be material that is current and feels like i feel more excited to yeah. share if you do stuff that we did before covid you kind of go like oh, fuck and sake. you don't know whether you hate yourself more or the audience for laughing at it you're like oh, yeah god not you fucking you don't love encourage it then. me <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, so what was that gig in New York like then? What was it? Was it quite was, a big room? Or? No, it was just a little like black box type of thing. It was funny. It was funny because the audience like laughed at different points, you know? And uh, like, you know, I've got a joke where I go, oh, I just turned 47 years ago. Yeah. And um, and I went, just turned 40. They're like, woo, yeah. And I was like, seven years and I go there. Oh, like you tricked <laughs> me. <laughs> I was going, oh, no, no, that's the joke. Like, yeah, this is how this oh, works. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, it was it was funny, actually, yeah. just seeing how they re and, and talking about parenting and kids and stuff. And they just have slightly different approaches. So it would yes. be it would have been nice to have done some more gigs. But, you know, it was really fun and, yeah. and it, it went well. It went as well as it could have gone. And that's the thing mm -hmm. that kind of gets you back in then. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. now that's it. You're kind of back in doing Glasgow. New York and HRT. So that's <laughs> been what it is. <laughs> what a combination. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're doing the Glasgow Comedy Festival. Yes. And it's, it's Gen X rated. Yep, that's right. Love it. Yeah, well, that's what I've become come to realise um, doing these new material nights. I did uh, Julia's gig in Leith. Um, and that was really fun. But the audience are... I'm realizing they're a different generation from me and I actually really do feel it much more um, viscerally <laughs> <laughs> than I did before, I think, because I, I did, you know, I am, I am nearly 50. Jesus Christ. Don't say that. Uh, oh, <laughs> I know. I can't believe it's actually happening to me. <laughs> Why? Um, that's how linear time works. <laughs> but <laughs> what can you do? But it is, it is weird because I sort of feel like my experience Experiences are different from theirs, but also my context. So yeah. the way that I was brought up, the ideas that I've got in my head. And the thing that the sort of first thing that made me realize that was um, my experience of losing weight, which is when I was, um, it, you know, 15 years ago, I think it was. Was it 15 years ago? Yeah, about that. When my son was born, um, I had always been big and I after my son was born, I was like, right, to be honest with you, um, I was off on maternity leave and I thought I've got a chance for a big reveal. I love a big reveal, right? <laughs> and uh, it really like <laughs> suits my brain. And I was like, away from it. I was like, imagine if I start, if I go on a diet now, by the time I go back to work, I could be like, ta -da! Yeah, <laughs> you know, a whole new me. So that was kind of helped motivate me. And I, I like lost six and a half stone and it was quite a, a massive change for me. Ended up being negative in some ways because I lost my mind but um <laughs> but uh it was really interesting seeing how differently people treat you yeah and how people responded to that so the way they responded to the weight loss the first time around was they were I got so much praise and respect for it mm -hmm. and people were like oh my god Julia you know you, you, you look so good but all the implication is you were such a fat fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like when people say that, it's just like, remember. They're like, like oh, thank God. you still the same person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're finally more socially acceptably, you know, you're fitting in with the world. Yeah. Um, so I got all this praise and respect and everything. And and then I gained all the weight, slowly gained all the weight. And then some more through, you know, just life. And uh, and then the pandemic was particularly bad for it as well. Yeah. As I think probably everyone put on a bit of weight. During yeah. Time. I put on two stones. <laughs> but um, so... My experience this time of having to lose it because my knees are fucked. Um, I've lost about four stone now, but nobody says anything. Right. And and that is 
Great, I'm exactly right. And you shouldn't comment on someone's weight and it shouldn't be the most interesting thing about me. Yeah. And it's not, um, it doesn't make me better or worse and it's none of your business really. But because I'm Gen X, I was raised on, you know, all that. And I need the validation. I'm like, <laughs> you fucking why tell is me. nobody <laughs> telling me I've yeah. looked great? And I look thin, you know, and it's that realization of like, oh, right. Okay. It's a different time, different yes. generation. And then people are responding uh, in a different, and that's good. That's great. Yeah. But I have a, I'm like, oh, right. I, my need for that validation is actually really toxic and really unhelpful. And that's something that I need to kind of unlearn. Yeah. Which is tough. Yeah. And there's, and but there's so many more examples uh, that are similar you, you, when you get to this age and you feel yourself kind of bristling when you hear about, you know, how young people. Yeah. What young <laughs> people are doing. Young, I um, yeah. I know. Yeah, I get exactly and you're what like, you mean. Oh, that, why are they doing that? Or yeah. you know, whatever. And you just... And you go, oh, maybe take a step back and think, why is your reaction that? And why do you think that? And it's actually that really very helpful. It's hard mm. to not just go like, the fucking idiots, what are they doing? <laughs> yeah, we yeah. did it, this and this, yeah. this, you do it. But realising, like, going back, because my first stand-up show, solo show um, in Edinburgh was uh, Fat Chance, and it was about losing the weight. Mm -hmm. um, and it got made into a Radio 4 special. And, nice. it, and it sort of interested to go back and look at, how maybe fat phobic some of it was yeah you know i don't think it was too much but i definitely feel like my attitudes changed a lot towards myself as well as to nice. you know um just general body acceptance uh, yeah uh, generally so that's been that that was sort of the beginning of it and then you have ultra other cultural references that young people just don't get and you're like oh my god yeah i mean i grew up without computers or the internet or mobile phones or anything so of course my experience of life is going to be yeah. fairly different from young people's it's like the matthew perry dying this week like everyone kind of my age like i'm 37 and everyone's like oh my god it's fucking awful i grew up on friends but there's some people are like friends is the worst show and it should be yeah, cancelled and you're yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah but that was then you yeah. can't keep looking through that lens and going well back then it was horrible like yeah but it is really difficult, isn't it, Ralph? Because you kind of go on the one hand, we go, oh, different times. And should we, you know, it's like you look at historical crimes, yeah. you know, and people being held to account and you think that's right. But how much do we forgive, you know, art or, for yeah. example, stand up comedy from 10, 15 years ago? Do we go, oh, well, that was that of the time? Or do we go, no, actually, that's always been wrong. And yeah. Do we, you know, but it's I think tough. I think it's just giving people the opportunity to grow and to change and to say that was wrong. And, you know, I think that's the big thing is having the, the people the chance to say, hey, that wasn't right. I will correct it. We'll make it yeah, better. Yeah, yeah. I know and, I said that before and I joked about that before. And at the time, yeah. you know, that was how I saw the world. But now I see that's toxic. That's bad. And yeah, and we can move on and we, you know, we yeah. can still be funny. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's definitely tough. Um, but like, cause I, like when you go to comedy clubs now, I don't know. It's it's kind of a lot of younger people in there who yeah. are going to comedy shows for the very first time, so they've got no concept. And a lot of the lineups at weekend shows are going to typically be probably thirty plus. Yeah. So they're I think there's be... a chasm like between us. Yeah. You know? Or in terms of attitudes and uh, and and just yeah. general mindset, and I think that is a challenge probably. Yeah. For, for comedians to sort of meet them somewhere so, in the middle. Someone told me that like Raymond Mearns has got like a really funny bit on like Love Island and stuff like Raymond that. Raymond Mearns has got a really funny bit on everything. <laughs> I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I had never, I hadn't, I was just like, oh, he he knows that he's going to like play into that. He'd come up yeah. with that bit. And that was the first time I'd heard that. I was like, oh, he fucking, he's really putting an effort into then playing to the, the younger audience. I, th I actually am not sure that's true. I think he is just a naturally funny person yeah raymond can do he can make anything funny <laughs> it, 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 it just comes naturally to yeah. him you know um and he's very clever and he's very well read yes you know so he knows a lot about a lot um yeah and he's just a he's a funny funny guy I, I was flying up against not up against him at the same time as him in the grass market two years ago mm -hmm. and just to try and fly at the same Unlucky. time as him <laughs> yeah. when he's he's going Did listen to him? he identifies as a snooker table the, the people that i'm trying to get in and they're like oh brilliant they're going over to him and 
he's just ripping everyone apart. Yeah. I was just like, this guy is like a force of nature. He's like, I've never seen anything like it. I remember doing a corporate thing um, with them. It was like an awards for, and it was something like small independent business magazine awards. You know, right, like something yeah, super niche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he got there and went, what is this? What is this? And then went out and did like 20 minutes of specific material for small independent business <laughs> magazine. Oh, <laughs> you know, and you're just like, how does he do it? Fucking okay, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so your, your show, your Gen X rate, yes. so it's, it's all about the kind of relating to, what is it, Gen? Well, Ralph, it's an interesting question to ask me what it's all about when it isn't written. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say. I imagine the blurb. that's what... <laughs> <laughs> the, the blurb going to lead you to say that. Based on uh, kind of what I've been finding myself talking about on stage as I've tried to, you know, do new material and definitely what I've been... Per what's been percolating in my brain yeah. um, as I've gotten back into that kind of way of thinking... Um, is what I've always talked about, which is my experience of yep. life as it's happening. Um, the mishaps usually, but you know, that's, that's always going to be what informs my writing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. I always say like to like, just find the most unique things about you and no one else could have done that. Yeah. No one else. You can never like, copy that material. If it's only ever happened to you, then mm. how can anyone ever be mm. as unique as that? Yeah, but also, you know, your experiences, if you just talk from a place of truth, and I think for me that's always been extremely important, that everything that I say is is true, has happened, or is how I think or how yeah. I feel. Um, I mean, sometimes exaggerated for comic effect, for yeah. sure. But um, it has to come from a place of truth. And I think if you do that, then that is what's relatable, yeah. you know, because people can see... Um, they can relate to you as a person or your yeah. experience. Yeah, if it's true, if it's honest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when does the when does the, the writing start for the Glasgow Comedy one? Because I'm doing, I've got this <laughs> show as well, and I'm like, when the fuck am I going to write? When this? does it start? Yeah, 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 yeah. Should really have already started, surely. Yeah. Well, it's It'll March. Come. Yeah, <laughs> that's fucking. I yeah. thought that as well. I was like, at, at the end of for the Fringe, I was like, March is ages away, and now yeah. tomorrow is not that two days time is November, and I'm like, oh shit. I know, and I live my life like that. I always say yes to things that are so far in the future they're never going to happen you know and that and then suddenly they're like tomorrow and you're like ah um someone and all told me like to the oh sorry carry no, on no no someone talked about the rule of accepting a gig is uh, only accept it if you would do it tomorrow yeah and well, I, I do not I, do that. I've been stung by that so many times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. You go, right, I accept every gig like it's never going to happen. Yeah, so that's brilliant. Um, it's partly because I am um, get nervous uh, about it, and that's as well from just being away from it. If you leave it too long, you get yeah. disproportionately ner anxious and nervous. But I've been gigging a lot more in the last few weeks, and it's easing. It's subsiding s somewhat. Um, Are you getting back to them comparing? Yes, yeah, I compared a couple of gigs actually last week. Um, comparing another one this week, and myself and Viv are starting up a new material night. Um, so which is sort of, I want to fill the hole that yeah, yes, bar left. Yeah, because that's a that was um, that was Wednesday every single Wednesday, every wasn't single it? Wednesday, yeah. Um, and it was a really lovely time, and it was a really lovely bunch of people that were sort of coming through that would come regularly to yeah. that, and I really enjoyed it. It was like as much social life for me. Um, but, uh, this time we're going to, it's by coastal cause I live between the two cities, Glasgow yeah. and Edinburgh. Um, and we're going to do the second and fourth Wednesday uh, in Glasgow at Jimmy's in the park bar on Paisley Road West. And then the third Wednesday at the Le Leith Depot, which is a lovely wee room. Yeah, it's cool, both, isn't it? both rooms actually reminded me, gave me the same kind of feel as yes bar, like in terms yeah. of the size and intimacy of them, which I think is kind of important for a new material night. And I... And I think having a new material night where there's like really permission to fail, stakes are low. That's it, low stakes. So key. Yeah. It. And, it, and you know, because if you do, even when you do Red Raw, you sort of feel like you can't really go up there and yeah. do stuff that's totally new. And yeah. you don't want to as well. Yeah. And then um, you go, right, I'll shit sandwich it. Yeah. And so then you end yeah. up actually only doing like three minutes of new when yeah. you've got a 10 and you're like, yeah. you really just want to do 10 of new. Exactly. But so this the idea for this is like everyone gets 10 minutes and, you know, if people yeah. need a bit longer, whatever, then that's cool. But it's just, it's just going to be a case of can we get the audiences? And that's the difficult part. And I'm not strong on admin. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So please, please come. Please come into the gig, um, yeah. Yeah, but I think that's really important. I think just stage time is like absolutely crucial for yeah. the developing. material. Is it's like it's so much fun. 
Yeah. And you try and explain that as a comp, yeah, this is fun. It's never going to happen again. Mm. It's, you will see this night. Some of these jokes never happen again. Mm. Well, well we, we had, we had, when I did Yes Bar, Kevin Bridges came down and did, um, did the gig and he was so nervous beforehand. He was like outside pacing back and no forth. Because he was like, oh, I haven't done a gig this small. We could, like see the whites of people's eyes. He was absolutely shitting himself. But he did, you know, the, the sort of hoose race. Yeah. He did that. No way. Yeah, so we all, like, this tiny little room, we got to see Fuck. the, it, you know, the sort of infancy of that bit of material, which was lovely. So that's an that's that's iconic cool. bit of material yeah. from him. And that's yeah. starting. And it was notes and... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I loved that venue. I loved it so much. But I, I, yeah. when I started, I was only, like, the, the Sundays. I didn't, I wasn't, I think, I had, like, one weekend or two weekends with Viv. I was the Yes Bar Virgins one. I was right. very much the, the open spot night. Was it Thursday as well? Yeah. yeah, it was Thursdays and Sundays. I was just like driving through, like, <laughs> just like, oh, I'm going to die on my ass again. <laughs> but I have to say that my, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing a regular night again. I'll do, I'll probably compare two out of the, out of the mm-hmm. three, uh, one in Glasgow, one in Edinburgh. Um, and then cheekily get on the other one <laughs> so I can do 10 minutes myself. Uh, I think but you, book, you book yourself for 15 yeah, yeah, for those yeah. ones. <laughs> yeah. That's what I do at Spandex. Headline. Like, I'm doing a 20 tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I have um, stopped drinking. Um, and that was a big part. <laughs> I definitely drank, uh, you know, probably more on those nights than I normally would at other gigs, just because it felt like, you know, you're at home. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, just having a few drinks. Like, it's so, social. It's just used yeah. to where your friends are. Yeah. So I am finding that's interesting sort of gigging now, not boozing. I'm not completely stopped drinking. Um, I still drink when I go on holiday. Yeah. Been on four holidays this year, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, actually true. But it's it's much better. I'm finding life is so much better. Yeah, so much better. Definitely was drinking too much and and have been for a long time. Yeah, um, and feel healthier and sort of sharper and more myself. On the flip side, booze definitely gives you a certain amount of confidence, or it knocks the edges off. And yeah. I also recently discovering I've got ADHD. And everything I definitely I'm realizing now how much I used alcohol to get over that sort of social awkwardness of yeah the interactions of being around a lot of people um which I find quite difficult I'm I'm fine one-on-one that's how I like yeah that's how I like to have my inter- social interactions um I don't like groups I've never liked groups unless they're all watching me and I'm doing all the talking right so green rooms are a fucking nightmare for <laughs> green you green rooms are a wee bit of a nightmare um but i'm getting over that so uh but yeah doing it's a very it without uncomfortable booze, thing it, it makes anyway. a new experience yeah, yeah it is yeah. a bit awkward and difficult and you're sort of like I'm yeah like avoiding eye contact I'm like, oh, look at me i'm so awkward i didn't realize how awkward i am yeah i think everyone's mm-hmm. kind of like pacing everyone's maybe just trying to say something every few minutes to try and keep the chat going in the green yeah. room but they are very uncomfortable yeah and there is a certain there's this sort of weird hierarchy in comedy um which you know for better or for worse it exists and yeah. so that affects the dynamics of relationships and conversations and people are like trying not to say the right thing and trying to you know have the correct amount of deference and you know or yeah. not or failing and people cringing oh so it's a weird it it's is a it's weird such a one. weird thing and plus people that are drawn to doing stand-up comedy tend to be i would say probably I can't wait. To, <laughs> I can't wait to hear how you're describing because my head, I just went fucking mental. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of a nice way of saying fucking mental. Um, I think there's the reason that you hear we're we're sort of becoming is becoming a trope of a stand up comedian going. I've got ADHD. Yeah. Um, is because I think that it's it makes perfect sense that people who are neurodiverse would be drawn to. Um, performing because yeah. the adrenaline that you get actually mi- is really c- relaxing and calming and helps you to focus in a way that you can't in your everyday mm-hmm. life because that's the only way I get anything done is when it's last minute there's a crushing deadline yeah you can relate of course oh, you yeah, can yeah, right yeah. so you know that's and, and that's how kind of it lends itself the two go hand in hand I think a lot of creative people which we would talk about oh creative types or sensitive types yeah. are actually just you know it's um it's a diagnosis. That's the thing I say, you know, um all my life, you know, after getting figuring out that I have ADHD, all my life I thought I had a personality. Turns out I just have symptoms, you know. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, how do you unpick yeah. 
how do you unpick what you think what makes you you, you yeah. from actually just a symptom of how your brain works but then yeah. in a way all of our personality quirks are just it's just yeah everyone's unique and you know way. our brain chemistry really aren't yeah. they if you think about it so yeah. mm, on the one hand it's helpful to know that you're not a bad person or lazy or stupid or whatever um it's just that your brain's a bit different works a bit differently but yeah. i think it can you can go too far down that route of like everything you do isn't you you know where in actual fact everything it's yeah, yeah, all yeah. it's all you yeah, you know you can, and that's you just can put it some things to, to like adhd you or some things to yeah. just it's just who you are as a person yeah yeah exactly you know so and all these kind of personal words we would use to describe people's personalities are now becoming you're like oh no that's just you know you're not an extrovert or an introvert you know you're an ambivert we had yeah. that one oh what's that a mix of two Okay. <laughs> well that i suppose is like uh, we, you know gender but let's not get into that but, <laughs> but you know it's a whole I, other podcast yeah 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 it, it is but i think it's really interesting and i think it's great that we're thinking about these things yeah. more but at the same time the gen x are in me is like you know <laughs> let's um Shut up, you know oh god everyone just lighten up you know let's not get yeah. bogged down in it and um oh kids are just too sensitive and i'm like no that's actually you being incredibly judgmental and then just mouthing yeah you know the the stuff that got stuff shoved into your head by your parents yeah. and the, you know are you, you know like a regular browser of like tiktok reels i don't i don't have tiktok Yes. I don't have TikTok. Even saying that makes yeah. me sound 105. I have I have got a TikTok account and I think I maybe posted one embarrassing video uh, during the pandemic, which reminds me I should probably delete that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I don't go on it because I can't cope with the dis another distraction. Yes. I barely get anything done as it is. Yeah. So I know myself and I'm not going on there. Yeah, I'm listening. I'm just not going on there. But then, Ralph, I, do I have to go on there to sell my show? Yeah. This is the worrying thing, and I don't know what to do. This is the quandary I'm finding myself in as a Gen Xer, for sure, is I see these days how things have changed quite dramatically and quite rapidly in, in terms of how you marry stand-up with sort of online um, yeah. content creation and consumption. And so you go, right, well, everybody's online, and so people are quite rightly doing podcasts, you know, creating online characters and all sorts yeah. of things. And then that's what's driving ticket sales. And that's actually becoming the the, the thing that uh, informs a stand up in a yeah. way, or certainly the, what the live shows are. Um, but if you're like my generation, I don't want to be on TikTok. I find Same. it really, it's not good for my brain. Even like Twitter or X or whatever the hell yeah. they're calling it these days. Even that, I, I delete that app from my phone because it was too much. I found it really poisonous. Yeah. Um, and I just have to go on it through Safari. So I still do go on it and I check it, but I'm not on it hardly ever. Yeah. Um, what am I? No, I'm no. on Instagram. Yeah. I'm on Instagram. I don't post that regularly, but I think I'm going to have to because I think that I will not sell any tickets if I don't. Like, it's now become an essential part of Sadly, promoting yes. your live work has been having some kind of presence online. And whether that's posting clips of yourself doing stand-up, which I don't really want to do yeah. because that doesn't feel right for me, what is it going to be? Yeah. Know. So I'm trying to figure that out. But it feels like... It's been done the right way around. You've learned this, the comedy skills. You've learned your comp and the, the material right. And whereas a lot of people are going selling out like shows. Oh, when they are not ready to be Who doing... don't have those live skills. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's hard then to convert your sketches to live. Stand up show, yeah. Like, I mean, you it can be done. someone in particular? I'm thinking of loads of them. Yeah. I'm thinking of loads of them. I know some of them do, some of them do it well, but I know a few of them that don't. But it is hard to then go, like, there was early episodes of this podcast where I was literally just doing solo episodes talking about, like, I don't want to do Instagram, I don't want to do TikTok. Yeah. And now fast forward, like, two years later, I'm like, I've just started to do, like, that a little bit more. Yeah. And I still hate myself. Right, okay. <laughs> I still hate myself hate every day. I think hating yourself that. is, like, a defining characteristic of being a stand-up, so I wouldn't worry oh. too much about that. <laughs> <laughs> it has to happen that way. Yeah. Yeah, but it's that tricky of, like, you don't want to get pulled into it. You don't want to waste your time on it. But then that is the thing that sells tickets. It's frustrating. Yeah. And I would really like to be a YouTuber and um, talk about clothes. Yeah. <laughs> is that, is that like, your YouTube algorithm? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I am 
un- I have an unhealthy obsession with clothes and fashion, and I absolutely um, love that. Right. Love that shit. But I think it's really important to be sustainable because <laughs> the planet is on fire. Hell yeah. And we're all going to die. Um, <laughs> That's the end of the podcast there. <laughs> yeah. The planet is on fire and we're all going to die. All good, right. Good night, everyone. I've been Julia Southern. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> Uh, there's a few things I always ask guests that come on as well. It's about uh, like their best gigs and their worst gigs ever. Right. Do you have a gig that stands out in your head of like I love stand up? This is this is a day that I loved it the most. Hmm. Well, I really loved performing at the Pavilion in Glasgow. Nice. I supported Catherine Ryan. Sweet. There and. Um, that was lovely, partly because her audience are lovely. Yeah. And she is lovely. Yeah. Um, uh, but also because the pavilion is like such a institution in Glasgow and I'd been there so much as a child and yeah. it just felt like it was so thrilling to be able to perform there. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just, it was lovely. It was great in every way. It felt really dreamy. Um, what was it like walking out on the stage like when it was empty? Because I know people, you kind of go in, you do your sound check and everything like that. Was that insane? Yeah, do you know what? It looks look bigger out. when it's empty. It's a, it's a weird thing. When all the seats are empty, you're aware yeah. of all the seats. I don't know. There's something about when you go out and all the seats are full and the lights and everything. You cannot, you can't, you can't see as much of it. Yeah. Although they are quite close to you with the way the pavilion is. Um, yeah, it was like, oh my God. Uh, but yeah, it was great. So, and then conversely, worst... Um, gig which was also an interesting experience was i did um britain's got talent no <laughs> did you? yeah yeah i did an uh, audition for britain's got talent which i <laughs> which oh was, god <laughs> so you i don't you, you you'll know the way it works um so the producers reach out to you they've seen a clip or something online and they go hey would you like to yeah. audition we think you would be good and, and and i was like i don't really watch the show i don't really believe in that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. But at the same time, hey, if it goes really badly, it'll be a fun 10 minutes <laughs> of new material. <laughs> well, yeah. spoiler alert. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I um, so I had to go down to London for like a pre-audition right, audition okay, for yeah, the yeah. producers. So you go down to do a pub gig and it gets filmed and everything. And so I went down and oh, fuck, I'll do that anyway. Went down, did that. And they said, we really like you to, to do the audition. It was at the London Palladium. Um, and it was like, I don't know, it was 2,000 people. Right. I think it might even have been more than 2,000 people, but whatever. But it was a big, a whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and I went down by myself because it was a sweet day and, you know, couldn't get, my partner couldn't get away without the kids and all that kind of thing. So I was on my own. <laughs> it was a very early start. And, um, and I sort of was too nervous to eat anything. And the day started at like half six and I didn't eat anything all day. And it was filming and chatting with uh, people backstage, you know, and you've 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 had to send them your material ahead of time, like yeah. to the word for word, exactly yeah. what you're going to say. And then they send stuff back, make suggestions, maybe don't you say this and that, right? get it down to exactly what you're going to do. So you're sort of going over that in your head and you know nervousness in the pit of your stomach and thinking well why am i doing this why am i doing this you know and then oh. being filmed having you know really natural casual chats yeah, with some yeah, fucking yeah. random magician <laughs> that you've just been paired up with and you're like is that hey. the, kind of the bit kind of backstage before you're coming out they're just filming you well, constantly it's actually in a totally different bit all right yeah but it's all got bgt and then they film you doing these interviews and they and they say so is there any judge in particular you like to impress and you're like you find yourself like saying the most ridiculous things like i was going <laughs> well i've always kind of found Simon Carroll. Like, oh my God! What yeah. am I saying? What am I Scrap saying? Scrap that. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you just like. Well, I don't know. What, what do you want me to say? You know. And then yeah. you have to do interviews with journalists, and then they, you do um like um they had this uh, what they call the hero cam uh-huh. or a hero shot. Yeah. And it's like this bit camera on a on a on a trolley, and um yeah. and and you just sort of like slow mo. <laughs> You like and you've got like wind machine and everything, and I was like, oh, this is amazing. I feel like Beyonce, you know. And then you do all the photos and everything. So it's like a big whole thing. Like mm-hmm. all day, there's there's stuff going on, and then eventually you go backstage just when the act before you is is on, and um, 
and you have to walk around and I'm like going and there's like the act before me is a singing dog. Not even. Like <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was a thing. Dog. Dancing it, dogs are one of my most nope. hated things on singing in life. Dog. Dancing dogs. Well, maybe it was, was a, I mean, I couldn't see. Maybe it was, maybe it was just like multi-talented. <laughs> like, singing dog. Singing and dancing. Oh, yeah, so I was like, oh. And I was like, oh shit, he's really good. That's tough to beat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then you go around and you meet Ant and Dick. And I was like tripping, Ralph, because I oh was so God. hungry, right? And, and so it was just, so the whole thing was just utterly surreal. I poked one of them in the face, I think it was Ant. And I was like, oh, you real? Like, what is wrong with me? Um, and then they were sort of like, mm, okay, is this woman a little unhinged? Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes, she is. Correct. <laughs> uh, and, and then they go, okay, well, time to go on. And I go, now, y- yes, now, on you go, this way, yeah, yes. So I sort of like stumble on stage, like trip on stage, like, oh God, what's going on? And then you've got all the judges there, you know, and there's like Simon Cowell, uh, Amanda Holden, Alicia Dixon, and David Williams. All right. And and I had not thought it through. So I had never really watched it. Well, I mean, I'd, obviously I'd watched it, but I'd yeah. not really watched it Think, I, Why did I not do that? Why did yeah. I not prepare, Ralph? Yeah, why? that's just a little bit of prep, a little yeah, bit of research. Yeah, just the tiniest bit of You're prep. You're like, I'll wing it. Yeah, because I was thinking in my head, I got my material, my name's Julian from Glasgow, just turned 40, ha ha ha, seven years ago. And um, or at the time it was four years ago, whatever. I'm going to keep doing that joke, Ralph, <laughs> yeah, yeah, until yeah. it's like in double digits. Ha <laughs> ha, 12 yeah. years ago, ha <laughs> ha, yeah. 20 years ago, ha <laughs> ha. Keep it. I'm going to keep doing it. Keep it. Um, anyway, so so I hadn't thought about the first bit, which is where they you have a bit of chat with the judges. Mm-hmm. Had not thought about that, had not prepared for that at all. What are they going to ask you? Oh, they're going to ask you your name. <laughs> and how old you are yeah oh you've uh, fucking blown the material yes exactly but i hadn't thought about it not good uh, in the moment didn't know what to do also had the producer head of going i've been told that this is what i have to do i have to do my material exactly like this so that's better better do that so simon goes oh what's your name and i go oh uh, julia that's fine that's fine it's fine to say my yeah, name twice no yeah. doubt <laughs> and uh, alicia dixon's like oh and where are you from and i was like ah, <laughs> in glasgow and she's like oh and, and how old are you and, and i just like shat myself because i was like oh uh fuck and what i should have done was just do the joke yeah just do the joke, oh, fuck. Just do the joke and then drop it I, from the next as bit. you were saying that i didn't even think of that i didn't think that no, was an I option know. well and neither did I <laughs> in the moment, but because it would have required rethinking because then you also think it, what That's requires that is their callback. Yeah. So I just sort of went, a lady never tells. <laughs> and like some kind of Victorian prude. <laughs> and Alicia's like, oh, come on. And then she like takes it upon herself to be this like total feminist. Oh, and she's like, hell. don't ever be ashamed of how old you are. You should be proud of your age. Tell us, tell us, tell us. And then everybody's joining in. The audience is like, tell us, tell us. 2,000 people, tell us, tell us. You're and like, I'm like, oh my God. I'm just like, oh, glory for whoever it was. Whoever oh, was the God. And then it was just like, oh, absolutely crumbled. And then they're like, okay, there you go. That's good. All right, well, that's in your own time and then the lights go out, the spotlight comes on and I'm like uh, my name's Julia I'm from Glasgow I just turned 40 four years ago silence <laughs> <laughs> did you so, get on? did you give a go yeah well I got um, David Williams liked me he said that I had a future in comedy which is a relief <laughs> uh, not gonna lie because uh, <laughs> But Unfortunately, like, David, you don't. Yeah, oh, I know. That unfor- it's so unfortunate, you know? I'm like, oh, no. The only person that had my back. Um, the girls, like Amanda and Alicia said, oh, you seem like really fun. I'd love to go out in a, for a drink with you. And I was like, well. I'm not going out with a drink with you. You <laughs> fucking not- ruined my punchline. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh. um, but then there was a sort of weird thing, actually, between uh, David Williams and Simon Cowell, where it, it was so awkward because he was going... Well, Simon was going, well, David, why don't you get a train up to Glasgow then? Put your money where your mouth is. And I was just going, what What are you talking about? And, you know, if you think she's got a future, why don't you go up and work together? Why don't you go up and work right with her? Like, why was he saying this? That's and I was so just weird. like, uh, what's happening? And then Amanda went, oh, it's because he thinks you're a very pretty lady. He's just, he's just um, joking. And I was just like, this is the worst experience of my life. Yeah, fuck. Get me hell. off the stage. I just want to go and rage cry at strangers <laughs> in Carnaby Street for 20 minutes. <laughs> Let me fulfill my destiny. And as I leave the stage, I pass the, the next act. Do you know what the next act was? And I am not joking. 
dancing hedges. Hedges? Yes. So you know like fake fake foliage. Yeah, yeah. You know the kind of thing you might see on sometimes on front of bars and stuff yeah. or whatever. It was that. They were their costumes were made of that. And there was three of them and they did a dance. I don't think they got through either, so fuck them. <laughs> yeah, I've not, not seen them uh, on the Royal Variety performance. Um. No. So that was kind of, that was really useful for me in a way. So I have to take that. Yeah. And and go, that well, that actually gave me something to then get back into writing and doing stand-up again. So it was useful. That's, All of life's experiences. Yeah. And I think as a stand-up comedian, that's where you realise... That's when you realise you're a comedian, is that when anything bad happens, you go, oh, well. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, know, that's that. Got a, that's got a, where all the best comedy comes from, from yeah. misfortune, yeah. isn't it? There's, there's it. nothing funny about someone having a great day and doing really well, <laughs> is it? That's not funny. Yeah, that's it. As I, when I got that gun pulled on me, all comics said to me was, oh, you, you lucky, lucky bastard. bastard. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Every no. single one of them. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. that... That is probably one of the best worst gig stories we've ever had on this podcast. Was oh, it? So yeah, that's no mean feat as well. Oh, thank you. Oh, here we go. Um, before yeah, you go, it's a, a strange few honor, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I ask uh, the guests just two small questions before they go. It's you get to suggest a guest for future podcast episodes. So around that you think is funny in Scottish comedy or comedy out in general, I uh, will try and get them on the podcast for a future episode. So who would you like to name? Well, I would suggest my boyfriend. Yeah. Yes. He is more of a cut Richard. Mellon, yeah. Who I also work with. He um, loves comedy probably more than I do. <laughs> yeah, he's a comedy nerd. <laughs> he's a total comedy nerd. He remembers jokes um, from years and years ago. He has seen so much, consumed so much stand up. He absolutely loves it. Yeah. Um, and I think has a, a nice and different perspective on it. Yeah, he's the other um, side of the mic. Yeah, but he's also performed stand up for. Oh, has he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, he I didn't did. know that. Yeah, he actually um, started when I did my very first ever fringe show, which is so back to front. The way that I got into stand up is so wonky, because uh, I was the on air co host of Fred McCauley on his radio show. I was also producer on that show, and um, I uh, uh, we had the Women from Funny Women competition mm-hmm. on as guests to talk about it and plug it to anyone that wanted to enter. And whilst they were on, I sort of flippantly said, oh, I quite fancy doing stand-up. Um, came off air and one of the producers said, right, we've signed you up to do the competitions. You just need to write five minutes. We're going to record it and we'll do some little segments of you um, getting some, you know, uh, tips from other comedians and uh, practicing in front of like small groups yeah. of people. And I was like, oh, all right, okay. And so my first ever gig was the Scottish Heat of the Funny Women competition in Edinburgh. And I and I won that. And it was recorded and they played clips of sort of my first ever gig. Oh, they played clips I mean, of I that. looking back now, I think, oh my God. Can oh, you imagine your first ever gig? Uh, oh my god. Being played on the radio. Um so that was how I kind of that was how I first started. And then I did so my first ever gig was played on the radio. Then my next ever gig well i did the uh the semi-finals for the funny women which was at the comedy store so my second ever gig was the comedy store in store. london no in manchester all right okay still still the comedy, the comedy store, store. Right, yeah. uh it took a long time after that before i was to be on that stage again let me tell you <laughs> as i'm sure you know um and then i i had another friend and naively i had this friend who was a comedian irish comedian uh, fran healy is very funny um, she said, oh, I'd like to do something at the Fringe, but don't really want to do a whole hour. Do you want to share it? Maybe you could do a little bit and I'll do the rest. Yeah. So like, yeah, that's cool. And it then ended up being, she went, um, I don't think I've got more than half an hour. So do you want to do like half an hour, 25 minutes? And I was like, yeah, sure. No problem. How hard can it be? Like it's, it's so naive, not yeah. realizing how long it takes to write and develop and practice and get material ready. Like 25 minutes when you've done one five minute set. <laughs> oh that's lunacy. <laughs> so that was my first Fringe. <laughs> Doing 25 untested minutes <laughs> oh, for God. the first time. Um, Did it go well? Um, yeah, it went all right, actually. Yeah. It went all right. Uh, but Richard, at the time, we were friends at the time, and we needed, because we realised we were both a bit short, a bit light on material, we're like, we, let's get someone to compare it and just do, and that'll just fill in the gaps and, right, okay. and make it sort of flow a bit better. So he just did a few minutes, and he was very good at it. And then he sort of did some stand-up after that. Um and uh, yeah, 
uh, I didn't know that. I, I, th- I just thought, always thought he was behind the scenes, behind yeah, the camera. Yeah, no, no. He did. He, he, he had, he was doing like weekends nice. and stuff. Yeah. Doing class. 10 and fi- I think it was when it sort of got, got offered, started getting offered like opening 15s and stuff. He was like, mm, it's not as fun. <laughs> right. Okay. Because it's sort of, you know, it is a, it is a massive difference from oh, yeah. doing that 10 spot. That's the sweet spot. Opening the show. Yeah. To do it. Openings, which is hard. Fuck yeah. You know, and that's been, <laughs> I've been coming back and doing, you know, opening 15s and you're like, oh yeah, this is a job. A slog. And then you yeah. see the, the person in the 10 spot crushing it yeah, and you're, you're like, like oh, fuck you. I know. And you're like, you think you're better than me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I took I a don't, bullet for this I don't, think that, I don't think that anymore. I don't think that anymore. But at the time, I think when you first start doing it, you're going, you have no idea how hard, much harder this is yeah. than what you're doing. Oh God. <laughs> so. Damn. But that's just the, yeah. So right. I would say him. Um, and uh, yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll get in touch. So you'd probably uh, kill me if I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the final thing is just if, if you any films, uh, books, albums you've been listening to recently that you just think more people should know about, it's a chance to kind of share a recommendation on that. Um, Absolutely anything. Do you know what? I don't really watch films Same. that much. I don't read books anymore because my attention span has absolutely destroyed. I only ever read books when I'm on holiday and I can be free of all other distractions and not feel guilty for sitting down and like, Mm -hmm. and get really into a book. Um, But I'll tell you what books I really want to read. Excellent, yeah. Let's uh, do that. That I've got (laughs) sitting on my bedside table (laughs) waiting for me. Uh, Joe Caulfield's book, The Funny Thing About Death, death. which I really want to read. Um, and Lou Sanders' book, um, what, what's, I can't remember what it's called. I think I've seen the front cover. Yeah. I think I know the one you mean. Yeah, what's that, mummy, what's that lady doing, or some, it's something like that. I'm getting a wee. I did actually read, uh, some of it on the plane, on the yeah. plane over to New York, and it was very good. I would like to finish that. And I would like to read Fern Brady's book as well. Excellent. Yes. Uh, so those again, are the three things I would recommend other people read. <laughs> highly recommend audiobooks. Right. Audiobooks are how I've consumed the last like tech. Well, and I'm books. a massive podcast fan. That is what I go. do. So I don't really do any listening, but podcasts I listen to constantly, constantly. And I almost don't listen to music anymore. Right. I listen to because I'm just so interested in people's stories. I love I love that shit. Yeah, same. And um, so I have some, my set podcast I listen to, This American Life. I would highly recommend that. Okay. This American Life, um, The Moth, which you probably already know. You don't no. listen to The Moth? Oh, The Moth's absolutely fantastic. Storytelling. Um, and they work with people uh, who people who've never maybe told a story before, told their own story. They can be powerful, but they can also be... Pr- Comedians sometimes do it, right. or professional storytellers uh, from all over the world. They're American based, right? Okay, um, and it's the power of storytelling, like, and the connection of it all. Oh, it's brilliant! That's Love my that. recommendation. Love that. The moth. Get the moth. The moth. And this American Life is always good. And there's like an absolute back catalogue of just tremendous, tremendous um, stories on there. So yeah. fucking brilliant. Yeah. Excellent recommendations to end the episode. Julia, thank you very much for coming. In. It's been a blast. Thank you. Thanks for, Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.